Good morning, tribe. All right, guys, we have a lot of super important things that we're about today. So we're going to go ahead and get started. All right. Storm, you will lead us 
You guys can have a seat. Thank you, Jesus. We're just getting started. <laughs> Welcome to Tribe. I'm Justin. Thank you, worship team, for kicking us off. We've got more worship coming up soon. Looking forward to that. And uh, a message from our pastor, Pastor Ken. He's right here. You'll see him later. Uh, but I'm Justin. So if you are new or have not met anybody here at Tribe, maybe you uh, drove by and you're just checking Tribe out, or you're in the neighborhood and same thing, just checking it out. You weren't invited and didn't come with someone. I'd be happy to meet you and introduce myself and um, have myself or meet you and learn more about you. Sorry, that sounded weird. <laughs> um, didn't roll off the tongue super smooth. I do this so much. I like don't always want to say exactly the same thing because you guys get bored and you tune me out. Um, okay, the first thing I'm going to do is we are going to use our texting service that we've uh, mentioned in the past. We're going to try to use it in our service to give you some information at the end of Pastor Ken's message. And so while it's kind of an optional, it still kind of is optional, we'd love to have you use it if you haven't before. And so um, the best way to get on that is to get out your phones. You can do that now. Ken will mention it later uh, at the beginning of his message if you don't want to do it now. Uh, maybe you'll do it when he tells you to. Um, Ian, if you could put up that slide that has the phone on it. There's a phone number. The phone number is 402-242-3900. So that's the number that you would send your text message to. And then just put the word join in the message and click send, and then you'll be on our list. And then, like I said, later in the service, we'll send you some information uh, on the topic that Ken's going to be talking about today. And um, there's some action steps that it'll take you to on our website. And so just wanted to give it in your hands right away um, before you left and forgot about what you should do after today's message. And so a little preview there. Um, as far as events go, uh, just a reminder, the youth group started, uh, they were going to take a break. They had uh, just came back from youth retreat uh, a couple weeks ago, and they were going to take a break until... Uh, later in August, early September, but Julie Ostrand kicked off their Dangerous Teens uh, study, and that's on Wednesday nights, so that kicked off last Wednesday. They're a huge turnout. I saw a, a picture of all these wonderful kids there. Amazing, amazing. I'm sure that was a wonderful kickoff, and they're going to keep going, so uh, you can still come. You're more than welcome to come. If you weren't there, weren't part of that uh, initial group, you can keep coming for the next three weeks, Wednesdays, 630 at the Reeves home, so Go to our website uh, to get information about where they live, and you can ask Julie questions if you have uh, concerns about what it's about or questions about what it's about. Uh, this Tuesday, though, there's a work day for the youth, so if you want your youth to participate in an outreach in our city, you can send them uh, to the Reeves home that morning at 9 o'clock, and they'll carpool your kid down to the Omaha Street School to North Omaha, and they'll be doing some painting, so it's a great way to give back to our community, have your youth step out um, of their normal circle and life this summer still, and uh, take part of a, in, in a cool outreach opportunity. Parents, I heard, are in, in, uh, invited to come as well, so if you don't want to leave your kid, you can go with them and help out as well. Uh, you just need to bring a paintbrush and some clothes that can get dirty, of course, so come on over to that Tuesday morning, and it'll last until they're basically done, so um, that's that. And then in two weeks, so next week we will be meeting here for service for church, but the following week, Sunday, August 16th, we have been invited to go our whole church. So everyone will be going to Dayspring Ministries Christian Center, which is uh, Pastor Ed King's church. So I can't remember quite when it was. A few weeks ago-ish, we had Pastor Ed, Ed King here sharing uh, at our church, and we're going to switch uh, take turns, I guess, and have um, our church go over there and support them. And Pastor Ken's uh, been asked to give the message there at their, at their church. And then afterwards, we're all invited to stay and have lunch together. So joining forces with our churches, really cool opportunity, something that maybe you've never done before. So uh, look forward to that. We will not be meeting here. We will not be live streaming on that day. So the only way to be a part of Tribe is to go to Day Spring Church instead and, and be with us there. Yeah, that's good question. 60th and Ames-ish. So uh, that's on our website as well. So if you need the address, go to tribeomaha.com, click on events, all these events I'm mentioning. If you forget them, you can go back there anytime and check them out. Uh, it feels kind of like fall outside. Yes, it's kind of chilly. Some of you might have sweaters on. So we've got a couple of fall things planned already, so we'll get those out. Our women's fall brunch used to be a spring brunch. Got canceled because of uh, the sickness, the virus. Uh, so now it's in the fall, September 19th, Saturday. 
So uh, ladies, if you want to participate in that, we'll have guest speaker Julie Dar there, and it's on the same topic as before, seasons of life. So uh, that'll be a great time to get together and fellowship and um, do things that you guys, women, teenage girls are invited to. So invite a friend, come out to that brunch, $20 a person, and you can register for that on our website as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Saturday. I'm sorry. It's not on the graphic. But the date is Saturday, September 19th at 9 a.m. So that's that's when that will be. And last fall thing for now. We'll kind of mention more as we get closer to fall. I know it's still a couple months out. Uh, the men's retreat. So October 2nd through the 4th. That's on there. That date's on that one. Um, we'll be having a men's retreat out at Bob and Naomi Bar's uh, ranch or farm. Uh, it's a couple, couple hours away or so from the city here. So that'll start on a Friday afternoon. $25 covers some meals and uh, your lodging, of course, if you want to bring a tent and camp out. Or there's a few places to stay inside if you want to. But great time for the guys to come out. And uh, there's a shooting range. There's some outdoor stuff to go fishing, ATVs, motorcycles, dirt bikes, hiking, nature, etc. So awesome time to get out and uh, fellowship with the guys as well. So that's $25. And likewise, you can sign up online for that. So all right. A lot of announcements, a lot of stuff coming up. Very excited for our youth. Very excited for all of you guys to have chances to participate and um, outside of Sunday service, of course. So we're going to do the offering now. So uh, ushers, if you could get ready to come forward. If you are watching online or if you didn't bring a uh, cash or check this morning with you, you can go to our website, tribeomaha.com, and click on the Giving tab. And you can uh, log into your account there and give via debit, card, credit card, or uh, ACH check payment that way. You can do a one-time gift or uh, set up recurring gifts and do it on a regular basis if you'd like to do it that way. And then, of course, if you'd like to mail a check, you can mail it to the address on the screen up there. The address is also on the website, same page on the website, so you can do it that way. All right. Lord, we just thank you so much for this morning. Uh, bless our worship team as they take us into our worship set here in a minute. And I pray for our offering, Lord. I pray for each one here and their family and their households and whatever financial situations they're in, whether they, they feel blessed or they feel uh, in a desperate need of something. Lord, I pray that you meet their need and show them what um, uh, you can do for them and what they can do uh, to give back and uh, to be obedient regardless of their financial situation. Um, we pray for them and we pray that this offering touches your, uh, your heart in the city and your kingdom, and blesses uh, the world in any way it can. Amen. And before we worship today, we have some special guests here. We have uh, John and Barb Malik, who are dear, dear friends of our community and our house. And uh, Barb Malik is the Director of Operations of Assure Women's Center. And uh, today we are tackling uh, the topic of abortion, how God feels about it, life, what's going on in our country. And at the end of service today, there will be some opportunities to do some pretty concrete things to kind of fight this battle. And um, Barbara and her wonderful team at Ashore are fighting this battle and they are doing amazing work and so I have asked her to come and share with us today what they are up to and what they are doing and how we can support them and help them. So uh, we just welcome Barbara. She comes up. Good morning. Um, I just want to tell you a little story about something that happened on Thursday night, just to let you know why Sure exists and the kind of work that we do. Uh, it was a slow night on Thursday night for some reason, and um, then we found out why. <laughs> Because uh, a girl had called to make an appointment, but um, and she said she just didn't know what she was going to do. Um, she was thinking she was probably going to have an abortion, but she wanted to come in and get the free ultrasound and pregnancy test and just find out information. Well, she went to our west office instead of to our central Omaha office. And then she called and said, please, can I still come? So fortunately, because the night was slow, we were able to fit her in over at our other office. She came in, 
and she was just shaken from the beginning. You could just tell she was, there was something big. And uh, she came in and um, we asked everyone, are, are you being threatened or abused at all? And she said, yes. Um, my partner, he, he um, abuses me. And I have an eight month old and I can't have another baby. I, I, if the police had come several times to their home because she had called them, and for some reason, I don't understand how this all works, but they had just told her to pack a bag and be ready. Now, why they didn't do something at the time she called, I don't understand, but anyway, she goes, how am I gonna have a bag packed and be ready to go and have an eight-month-old and, and have a newborn coming? And so we, we took her back and we just, we have a process we go through and we take everybody through the same process and, uh, it, you know, treat them with kindness. We share about the Lord. We pray for them. They see their baby on the ultrasound. Her baby was about eight weeks old. And I don't know if any of you have seen an eight week ultrasound, but the baby's pretty active. You can see it's fully formed. Um, and she saw that baby and she just broke down in tears. But the great thing is she left with that guy and it breaks our heart. But the thing is with our process at Assure, she got a call the very next day. And um, because we, we flag the ones that are in, are in need, more serious need of help. So she got a call the very next day and then we stay in process with her. We made an appointment for the next week. Um, so sh hopefully she'll come in the next week. And we assured her that we would help her. We would call if she was in trouble. She could give us a call. We would know her name will go out to our prayer list of people. We have hundreds of people on our prayer list that prayers go, uh, requests go out to every week. And so she is the reason that Assure exists. Um, I've been a, a part of Assure for 35 years. I was on the kickoff committee many years ago. And uh, even though I, didn't, I haven't worked there that whole time, I've at least been on the board. And so now I'm, I've been back for the last 13 years working there as the operations director. Um, we have really grown over the last few years, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because you've got an important message coming up. Um, but I just wanted to tell you about some of the things we do. Um, we consider ourselves to be the first step for women facing an unplanned pregnancy. So we want to be that first person she calls. We want to be the first face she sees. We're going to give her that pregnancy test, that ultrasound, community referrals. We're going to pray with her, like I said. We're going to share the gospel with her. Um, and then we keep in contact with her throughout the entire pregnancy. Then after that, we have parenting classes that she can take. Uh, we have baby items that she can have. Um, so we do try to stay in touch. Um, then we also train, we have, we were fortunate enough to uh, find out about this process. It's a linear process that we take women through. It's very successful. And we now train centers all over the United States to do the same process we do. In fact, our uh, training process just became their own 501c3. And uh, we have just joined ranks with Focus on the Family. And they are now giving scholarships for centers to come and take our training. So it's become huge. We're kind of blown away by that. Um, I, in my heart, it's still this little mom and pop operation, and it's not that anymore. But um, that's the way we feel in our hearts. We meet for prayer every day at noon. We fast and pray on a regular basis. We really want the Lord to be the director of our center. And so um, just to give you some statistics, and these forms you can find in the back. Um, in um, not this last year, because we don't have statistics, but the year before, we saw 2,355 patients. Um, 2002 tested positive for pregnancy. And um, 
out of those, a lot of the women that come to us are already determined to abort. They'll say, I have an abortion scheduled, but let me just come in and get your free ultrasound. We say, why don't you come in and find out if at least your pregnancy is viable? There's no need to get an abortion if your pregnancy is not viable. So we have them come in and talk to them. Well, out of those at-risk women, 85% uh, made a decision for life. So that was 1,684 life choices. And so um, we just really feel privileged to be a part of this. Um, I just want to close with this. You know, uh, we cannot count on the courts or the government to end abortion. I don't see it happening. I know some people have hope that Roe versus Wade is going to be overturned. I have very little hope of that, especially with the recent court cases that have come out. Um, if they can't tell, uh, make a law that doctors have to have admitting privileges in hospitals to see women who get damaged during abortions, which is what was in the most recent law, then how are they going to overturn Roe versus Wade? But we are the church. We are the people of God. Amen. We can snatch them out of the fire one by one. Amen. And that is what I consider that we do at Assure. And I'll tell you what, I know probably all of you are very busy people, but we are desperate for volunteers at the center, desperate. Uh, we have had staff working way too many hours just to keep our doors open through this whole pandemic and everything. And uh, what we mostly need are women that will be willing to walk with these patients through the entire process to share the Lord with them. It's a scripted process, so it's not like you would need to know a ton of information. We provide good training, but if you're looking for an opportunity to get into the lives of lost people and share the Lord with them and be able to be involved with them, it's just a perfect opportunity. So anyway, thank you so much. All right, stand with me. We're going to head into worship, guys. I mean, what a great opportunity to make a huge impact and be a volunteer. Pray about that. As you're worshiping today, you're worshiping in a climate in this nation. We have uh, the governor of the state of California saying it's illegal to have church, and you have people like John MacArthur holding church today in defiance of that order. It's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to worship. I've said this before. When you worship, you are changing what's going on in the spiritual atmosphere. And in the spiritual atmosphere, you have influence. So what you're doing is you're entering into an unseen realm and you're changing the dynamics there, bringing the kingdom of heaven into that dynamic. And that is creating a change in influence. So I said this before too, it's not about song time, it is about war time. So that's why I'm encouraging you to enter fully into worship this morning. Can I say something and tag team off of that? If you have something in your mind right now, like maybe, maybe I should raise my hands when I don't usually do that. Or mm, maybe I should go forward right now. Those thoughts are not from the enemy. Those kind of thoughts are step out in obedience. And when you step out in obedience to, to raise your hand to the Lord or to come up front and worship the Lord, something shakes in the heavenlies. It matters. How you worship matters. How you worship matters to the people next to you. How you worship can raise the water level of the Holy Spirit. Because when you choose to act in a physical way, that's an act of obedience. That's big stuff. That's a weapon. So I just want to encourage you. I just have a feeling that some of you have it in your minds right now. There's a thought in your mind, hmm, maybe I should do something differently than I normally do in worship. And I want to encourage you to please do it. Lives are at stake. The glory of the Lord. He's worthy of our action.
with some of the Meunites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming out against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already in Hazon Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard. And he said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to his descendants, the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and we will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. But now, here are men from Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite, and a descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. And he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours gods. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. And then some of the Levites from the Kohathites and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa, and as they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah, people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. 
And as they began to sing and praise the Lord, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. And after they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked towards the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. And on the fourth day, they assembled in the Valley of Baraka, where they praised the Lord. And this is why it is called the Valley of Baraka to this day. Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem, they went to the temple of the Lord with their harps and their lyres and their trumpet, and the fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel, and the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. This is the word of the Lord. This is how I find my battle.
Lord, I thank you for your truth. Lord, I thank you that you fight the battle. Lord, that all we have to do is come beside you and worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we love you. We honor you today. Come and have truth be spoken to our hearts. Check. There we go. Uh, children, you are released. Uh, thank you, worship team. We're going to return to a time of worship towards the end of the service as we take a look at some things we can do to respond to this issue of abortion and pro-life and championing life in the earth. A little bit of a disclaimer. Of course, there'd be uh, no deliberate effort to say anything graphic during any message on a Sunday morning. But with abortion, there are some things I think we need to look at as far as how those things take place, and so there will be uh, maybe a little bit of that involved, and so that just a little bit of a disclaimer for any kiddos who are still in the room who want to join us today. I want to invite uh, Carl, my brother-in-law, and Julie, my sister, to come on up. Uh, as we tackle the issue of abortion, they're going to give us a kind of a unique perspective and speak to us briefly. Then we're going to head into the Word. We're going to head into our message this morning, and then we're going to head into a time of worship and response at the end. So thank you for speaking to us this morning, guys. Thanks, Ken. Um, good morning, tribe. Good to see you all. Um, just had a, just a story to tell, really. Um, when we were pregnant with Emmy, we, uh, I remember going to one of the doctor visits and they said, hey, there may be some signs in the ultrasound that look like Down syndrome, but we're not sure. And, you know, in your mind, you're taken aback a bit. You're like, what does that mean? I think I had to Google some things. Um, 
fast forward, I think we went to the next visit, correct me if I'm wrong, but they were basically kind of like, hey, we were wrong. We were wrong. Everything's normal. Everything's good. Um, so we just continued the pregnancy. And then I remember I met Julie for lunch. She was going to another appointment, Boston Market. Do you remember in Boston Market? It was, man, it, it, I remember Boston Market. It was awesome. I had the meatloaf and Julie was like, okay, I'm going to go to the appointment. I had to go do something from work. Um, she called me maybe 45 minutes later and was like, hey, they're saying maybe something's wrong with the heartbeat and we should go to the hospital. And she actually didn't believe them. I think she had to call me three times and she's like, no, really come up here. And fast forward, get into the uh, emergency room and they're, they're like, hey, we're going we're gonna to have this baby now. It's an emergency C-section. And we have the baby. And so the things that I can remember, I can just remember a nurse walking up to me I could tell. I could tell when when Emmy was born, something was wrong just by reactions in, in in there, and something was off. And a nurse basically just walked up to me and was like, "Yeah, your child has Down syndrome." That was the delivery, and I remember feeling like I'm gonna pass out. Like, I I, I don't know quite again what that means. Um, I remember sitting down. I don't think we talked. Um, Um, I, I remember going to tell the family. Um, they took Emmy away. Uh, she had some heart issues. Um, the cord was wrapped around her neck. Uh, just thing, things were happening fast. And I remember, um, if you guys remember the old Methodist hospital, there's a walkway between the two buildings. And I remember I went through the doors and there were Paul and Dot and my parents and I think my grandfather. And I remember them looking at me with these huge smiles on their face and I didn't smile back. And I remember thinking like the, the thought of disappointment. So the story's going somewhere, but of, of disappointment. And I remember going and telling them and man, they just hugged me. They loved me. I remember calling Ken and Aaron and I think you're in Afghanistan and Aaron's first response was we love you. Um, but my world was rocked and I, I remember thinking, okay, I, I need to go back and, and be with Julie. Um, I'm not sure how she's doing. We all love Julie. Um, sometimes we're, we're as a husband, we're like, I, I have to be there for Julie. I have to be the support here. So I'm, I'm an utter mess trying to gear up to go be that for her. And I don't know how, maybe a couple hours had passed and I remember going to, whatever room recovery room she was in and I walk in and Julie is smiling like she looks the happiest I've ever seen her and I can't compute I'm like I, what is going on and so she tells me this story she says you know you know I was just sitting here and for those of raise your hand if you're a person that buys a present and you just can't wait for the person to, to open it. In fact, sometimes you might even tell that person what's in the present as they're opening it. I, I, I've been guilty of that. So Julie says, you know, I was, I was sitting here and it was like Jesus came into this room and said to me, Julie, how do you like my gift? Like he couldn't wait to give us Emmy. And he was so happy and so excited for this journey that we were going to get to go on. And I can tell you, I can promise you that from that moment on, we've been in this grace bubble of the world of Emmy. Is it hard? For sure. Like there are times that are really hard. This morning was hard getting here, but we love her. And we're in this bubble of, I've never said, why me, God? Why, why do we have Emmy? Why did you pick us? I feel blessed. She is a gift every day. For those of you that know her, you know she's a gift. She, she loves to sing and dance. She loves to hug you. Um, she's going to be a power for Jesus. And someday in heaven, I can't wait when she can walk up to me and have a conversation with me and say, Dad, thanks. I love you. Let's talk. Um, so anyway.
part two of that story. Thanks, babe. Yeah, Emmy truly is a gift. And she always has been. I know some of you have walked this journey for, with us for a long time, and Emmy is definitely a gift. I have to say, though, Down syndrome and autism does have its challenges. And so despite that, when we were thinking about having more children, Carl always said when we were dating, he said, Julie, we're going to have three girls just a heads up. And I was like, okay. And I always had this picture of having four kids. But we were concerned just our energy levels, our ability levels. Could we have more children? Some of you may not know, once you have a child with Down syndrome, you're much more likely to have another child with Down syndrome than your average person. And then the older you get as a woman, the more likely you are to have a child with special needs. So we waited about four years and we have Addie Rose, our beautiful little Addie Rose, who's also a gift as all of our children are. And then after that, we were serving in Africa. We came home. Carl's mother was dying of cancer. So we were here for about a six month period and it was a hard season. It was a hard season for me personally for reasons. It was a very hard season for Carl walking through obviously his mother dying of cancer. We were living with them at the time and I got pregnant. And I was so, we were excited, of course, with our, we do, we know every child is a gift and we were thrilled. And we went in for the eight week appointment and we could see the heartbeat. The baby was happy. The baby was perfect. We were so excited. And I just didn't give it another thought. And then we went in 12 weeks later and the nurse couldn't find the heartbeat. And we found out that we had had a miscarriage. And we were broken. We were broken. We were so devastated by that. Just because you know that once you create a child, they just, they live for eternity and the privilege to raise them and all those things. We were heartbroken. And I remember when you have a baby that's no longer alive, you have the option of having a medical intervention or going home and passing the baby naturally. So we opted to do it naturally. And there was about a week long period where I was walking around thinking, I have this baby that's not alive inside of me. This is just a very strange experience. And I went home and I remember it was about a week later and I passed the baby naturally and I didn't expect that to be such an intense, traumatic experience. It's very, and I'm sure it's very similar to maybe how some abortions happen where you're at home. I'm not totally sure, but my guess is there are some similarities. So it's a very intense experience. And I remember as the Lord was so sweet with Emmy to sit next to me, I remember being in the bathroom by myself and I had this picture of Jesus and this little boy about three or four years old, he actually looked a lot like Colton and he was just so happy in the arms of Jesus. And I thought again, this child is a gift. And it is a privilege to be able to think, you know what, we don't have that child now, but we will get to spend eternity enjoying that child. So here is my message of hope. Whether you've had a miscarriage or you've had an abortion, that child is absolutely in heaven right now. And we know in part, but that child knows in full. And I would submit to you that that child knows your name as your parents. And that child loves you. And that child wants you to be in heaven with them. They do. So if you haven't yet, I would say, give your life to Jesus. He is worth it. And give your life to Jesus for the hope of spending time with your child who loves you. So I will close with this. As we were worshiping, I had this picture of all these children in heaven gathered around and looking down and they thought she is going to tell them, she's going to tell them to give me a name, name your child, name your child. And she's going to tell them that they want me. That child wants me. So church, let's be an encouragement. Let's love each other. Well, let's love our children. Well, and let's encourage the brokenhearted because there is hope. Yeah, thank you for that word. Um, and I would encourage you to, um, if you haven't texted JOIN to 402-242-3900 to do that, because at the end of the message during the response time, uh, we're going to be delivering some information and some links for you guys to get involved with different opportunities there. So uh, the 402-242-3900 and texting JOIN to that will get you into the loop of information so we can get you the links uh, that you need to have for that. All right, let's pray guys. And then we're going, we're going to, we're going to hit this pretty hard and we're going to go pretty quickly through a fair amount of pretty important things from scripture. 
as we tackle this. But Lord, first we just acknowledge you. God, we want this to be your perspective, not the perspective of man. Not a political perspective, not a convenient perspective. We ask for your perspective directly from the throne right now. Amen. Ah, that, that might make it harder. I'm not sure to have that perspective. Okay, guys, um, if you want to open your Bibles made of trees and just kind of put your thumb in Psalm 139, I think that would be a pretty good idea. Um, there's another Psalm. Psalm 127 is another one. 127 and 139. Uh, when we get to our discussion of Scripture, we'll head into that. Uh, just as a little bit of a review on some important structural things that we have been talking about as we've been uh, encountering and, and tackling pretty difficult issues in our day and age. Uh, we've been talking about these two arms of the church, these two functions of the church, these two vital roles of the church. We have the oikos of the church. We've got the family of the church, the caretaking of people, the grace, the mercy, the come with whatever you've got and struggle with it at church. We've got just all of us in the local church taking good care of each other in a judgment-free zone as we just say, the doors are open to church. Come on in. Find Jesus. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life or what has happened. You are welcome here. And on that note, just on the topic of abortion, the, the statistics are st staggering, which means... Uh, Good chance people here in the room, people streaming, have had an abortion, experienced someone who has had an abortion, who have been through this, or, uh, you know, it, it is an emotionally charged uh, topic, and I, I just want to say, too, that there, none of this talk here today is about condemning or making you feel bad because you had an abortion or know someone who did. And we've been making this clear as we've been uh, navigating through these uh, difficult topics, uh, this has to do with the younger generation wanting to know what the church thinks, and it has to do with speaking corporately into the United States of America, saying, here's what God is saying. It isn't a message of condemnation or guilt to those who have experienced these things. So we, we've said this before, and we'll say it again, and that is part of the oikos function of the church, the local church. Then there's the function of the ecclesia, the big C church, the corporate church, as we all contribute our voice into being the conscious of a nation, as we all enter into being citizens of a free state who are providing the voice that God is saying to that state. And what we have said is that the church has been pretty silent and the church hasn't always tackled these things and the church hasn't always had a clear message on controversial issues, important issues, life and death issues. And the church today needs to find its voice and be the ecclesia of God. And so it's, at that point, it's black and white. I've said it's razor-sharp truths. You fall on one side or the other. It's not personal. It's not about you. It is about truth. It is about glorifying God. And it is about being a conscious of an entire nation. So there's two things going on. There's the, the oikos approach, which we are definitely doing. And there's the ecclesia part that we are definitely doing. Uh, sometimes we try to answer questions by answering asking questions and uh, who is God is one of those primary questions and the cornerstone sin of our world today of our society today is uh, people are trying to assume the role of being God themselves and that is why they're making decisions over their gender their identity and we've talked all about that that is why they give themselves a free pass to live however they want and in this case, this is why people are giving themselves the authority to actually take life. And that is because they are standing in the place of God and doing the things only God should do. And so the, the, the question is, who is God? Is it him or is it us? Does scripture have the right to order our lives and tell us what to do? 
Do we give scripture that authority in our life to tell us how to live? So those are two uh, really fundamental questions that we've been working with as well. Oh yeah, there's the number. Advance. Okay, well, we're having some technical difficulties. Uh, the slide I'm looking for, guys, is, um, okay, that's a good one, too. Uh, we talked about what is sin. It's just anything outside of the boundaries of where God has established life. So it's it's not like, well, keep the rule book so that you can be, you know, approved of by God. No, it's like God designed the universe. Inside that design is life, and outside of that design is death. Outside of that design is sin, missing the mark. And uh, it's like gravity. You can jump off a cliff, but the law of gravity is going to accelerate you towards the center of the earth. Spiritual laws are no different than that. If you operate outside of God's parameters, you will not experience life. You will experience death. So we've talked about that. I want to ask this question today because I think it is pivotal and critical towards answering another question later on in the next few minutes. What did Jesus' sufferings produce? He suffered. God, Jesus did not live an easy life on earth. Our job as believers is actually not to try to avoid suffering. If God asks us to enter into suffering, we enter into it. Jesus did that because his father asked him to do it. What did his sufferings produce? Life? Salvation? Redemption? Healing? Peace? Okay, these are all great answers. So we see that through suffering, we have redemptive work taking place. I love everything you guys just said. Three to come to mind, joy, reward, redemption. So Jesus suffers, and these things get produced. These things get produced through suffering. So one critical concept for this discussion today is that suffering has a very important redemptive purpose. That's important. What about your suffering? What about the suffering of people? Now, if you don't belong to Jesus, you're not redeemed yet. And as a consequence of that, I, I don't know actually what good your suffering will produce. But those who do belong to Jesus, those who belong to God, those of us who are following him, and obeying and uh, following in the path that he's given us to take, your suffering has profound redemptive value. Do you think that your, the Lord's suffering had no value? It had tremendous value. It had huge value. And we are all following him, and the sufferings that he's given us to endure for our lifetime have significant value. Hold on to that thought. That, that is an important thought. Um, let's see if we can go forward. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to move pretty quickly through some significant scriptures that point to where life begins and what God has to say about life in the womb. And uh, so we're going to rattle through about um, four of these. And we're going to talk about what scripture has to say about when does life begin? When does a person begin? And does God hold a value of life in a pre-born uh, status? All right. Well, we got Samson, who is called to be a Nazarite. It says from the womb. So it doesn't say from birth. It says from the womb. So Samson's there in the womb, and Jesus is like, and God is like looking at him as this called person, this Nazarite. Going forward, one. Isaiah, again, same deal, called from the womb. It doesn't say from birth. It doesn't say from an early age. Isaiah is in the womb, and he's called to be a prophet. Samson's in the womb, and he's called to be a Nazarite. Cruising through, forward again if we can. Hopefully, I don't know why my magic wand isn't working, guys, but go forward one. All right, so we have Luke 115. 
John the Baptist is actually filled with the Holy Spirit when he's in the womb. And then uh, later on in Luke, well, forward, let's go forward one more. So then John the Baptist is there in the womb. Mary uh, greets John the Baptist's mom, Elizabeth, I think, and he leaps in the womb. So you have all of this activity and all of this life and all of this eternal calling for someone who hasn't yet been born. So for sure, the scripture is pointing to what we have in the womb is a prophet, a Nazarite, a, a person, someone with a calling. In other words, we're not dealing with something that isn't human. We're talking not only about a human person. We're talking about a person who already has their callings and their destiny programmed in. So what's going on in the womb is spectacularly significant. Now, <laughs> in Hebrew poetry, uh, Hebrew writing, period, you don't, off, you don't always see events occur in chronological order. Sometimes uh, in, in, uh, in the Psalms and Hebrew poetry, you'll see things happen that aren't quite lined up linearly in chronological time. I'm actually going backwards in time. So the first thing we've said is that in the womb, we've got extraordinary value, human life, prophets, destiny, all of this is there in the womb. And now I'm going to go to a series of scriptures, if my magic wand will get me there, uh, before the womb. So this is Jeremiah 1.5. It's a very famous scripture. You've heard it. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I've appointed you a prophet to the nations. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew who you were. Wrap your mind around that for a second. Before you're even fo formed in the womb, God knew you. You're not even in the womb yet. Going back in time, but even before conception, I don't think this is specific or special or unique to Jeremiah. I just think it's a thing. I think it's the way this, this spirit realm works that God made. Now I want to go to Psalm 127. And that is uh, listed there. I, I am not going to put the entire scripture on the screen. And I... We're going to have a small lesson on reading the Bible in this particular verse because I want to unpack something here. Psalm 127, 3, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. Now, in my Bible, when I read the word gift, there's a, a little Roman numeral there. And this is why I really suggest having a study Bible because it will provide, it will provide more information so that you can read the Bible dimensionally. Well, what does he mean by that, dimensionally? You do this all the time. When you, when you see me as a person, sure, you, you see Ken Jensen's body. You see that Ken Jensen has no hair. You see that Ken Jensen's wearing a shirt. And you see the physical dimension of me. But you also know that in even in the physical dimension, blood vessels, the heart, you know that I've got organs. You know there's all this stuff going on in my body you can't see. So your mind knows dimensionally that there's more to me than just even what you can see. And then you know that, well, Ken's like me and like any other person. He's got a soul and a spirit, and there's these other dimensions to a person that you're aware of that you can't see. Right? So you actually think dimensionally all the time. You see a car, but you know it has an engine, etc. When we read scripture, I'm really encourage you to begin to read scripture dimensionally. And that means you're looking beyond just what's coming at you at face value. So let me give you an example of that. We're going to unpack Psalm 127.3. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. Now, gift has this Roman numeral, which means there's something more to this particular word. And in my Bible, it says like literally... The word gift is saying, in the innermost parts of. 
So if I were to insert that literal phrase in place of gift, it would say, Behold, children are in the innermost parts of the Lord. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Gift. But wait, it's saying in that one word that children are in the innermost parts of the Lord. And then I look further at this word gift, like in the Hebrew, and it's talking about possession, heirloom, or a specific territory or assignment given to a particular tribe or family. In other words, it's like, um, it's like a, uh, a piece of land is your inheritance. It's something given to you and your family and your tribe to take care of for your assignment on earth. That's what a gift is. It's a responsibility. It's a stewardship. It's an oikos given to you to take care of for your lifetime. And it came from the innermost parts of the Lord. And that's what children are. So I am going to put this verse, Psalm 127.3, my own words. And I'm going to put all of those dimensions together into one statement. So when you hear the word behold, that's like Old Testament for check it out. Look at this. Be amazed. So this is what this verse is saying in 120, Psalm 127.3. Be amazed by this. Children came from the innermost parts of the Lord, and while they belong to him, he gives them freely to you and to your tribe as a precious heirloom specific to you and your responsibility and your assignment on planet Earth. So where did children come from? The innermost parts of the Lord, which explains how God knows who Jeremiah is even before he formed him in the womb. What I'm getting at and what I'm trying to tell you is that wherever a person begins, it happened before conception. It's like, well, when are they a person? Is it at conception or is it maybe after a few weeks? No, you were a person in the innermost parts of the Lord before you were even formed in the womb with a destiny. That's the power of what's going on in there. So the discussion of like, oh, when does life begin? Well, somewhere in cosmic space, in the internal places of God, somewhere in there. I want to take you now to one, Psalm 139, 13 through 17. And we're going to do a similar thing with this passage. Okay, so this is another familiar text. Uh, I think this is David who wrote this, Psalm of David. Verse 13 says, For you form my innermost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. So the Spirit is uh, instructing David to say these things. He starts to talk about, you know, being uh, knit together in his mother's womb. And then I would propose to you what happens is he's getting this download from the Spirit. And what he does over the next couple verses is he actually goes back in time to where he came from. So why I say that is because in uh, verse... Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, it, it goes from saying, okay, in verse 13 it says formed. And then I think it's verse uh, 16, it says unformed. So he's going from formed to unformed. It, it's like he's backing up from when he was formed to before that to where he was unformed. Are you following me on that so far? So 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 is kind of the chronological order of where these verses are given. But I think it's actually going back in time because it's going from formed to unformed. So I'm going to read this to you backwards to put it into chronological order. I'm proposing to you that we're actually going from kind of forward in time from verse 17 back to verse 13. Okay? And if we're following what it says about Jeremiah, that he was known before he was even formed, this is going to make sense. So from 17 going back to 13, it's like the psalmist is saying this, How precious are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Even before he's formed. Way before he's formed. His unformed substance. How vast are the precious thoughts of God about a person. 
Verse 16, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. He's not made yet. And in your book were written the days that were appointed for me. When as yet there was not one of them taking place or taking shape yet. My frame, which means my bones, were not hidden from you. When I was being formed in secret and intricately and skillfully formed in the depths of the earth. I will give thanks and praise to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. And then it says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And formed my innermost parts. So even before we're formed in the womb, how precious and fast are God's thoughts towards us. When we haven't even had a day, God has been thinking about us. He knows us. He's given us a destiny. He's written in his book the days of our life. And finally, we're knit together in our mother's womb. I'm saying these things to you today because I want to emphasize the value of a human person, a human soul, and a human spirit to, to the Lord. And in our day and age, we actually argue, like, when does life even begin? And I propose to you that whatever you want to define that as, it, it is beginning before you're even conceived. That is when life begins. Since 1973, when abortion was made legal, 62.1 million people have been murdered. About 500,000 so far this year. It's greater than the city of Omaha. Due to rape and incest, less than 5,000 so far this year. Pharmacists for life think that chemically induced abortions could reach 250 million. Total worldwide abortions since 1980. Sorry, guys. 1.5 billion. Next time I'll think twice before asking for God's perspective. I have a list of abortion techniques I thought about reading. I, I don't know if I will. But basically, metal objects dismember and cut up the baby before it's removed in a lot of cases or chemically burned or poisoned. And partial birth abortion they uh, grab the baby and pull it into the birth canal and then insert a sharp metal object to vacuum out the brain so the skull can be collapsed. I think it's curious that if it's not a person, it has to be killed before it can be removed. If it's not alive, why do we got to kill it first? But this is the world that we're living in. Some people wonder, you know, uh, in the case of a worship team, you can come on up. Some people wonder, like in the case of rape, incest, or abuse, wouldn't it be better, you know, uh, to allow a child to go to heaven by killing it here on earth. But there are a couple of problems with this. First of all, 
the core sin that we're dealing with in this nation is that we're trying to be God when we are not. We are not God. We do not have the authority over life and death. Next, the problem is that we underestimate the value of the suffering God has assigned to us on planet Earth. The joy, the redemptive value, and the reward that comes with our suffering, all these things are forfeit when we decide we know better than God and that it's actually better for this child not to live on planet Earth. We're saying there's a situation so dire and so big of a problem that we can't actually trust God for it, and so we'll step in and provide the solution ourselves when we ourselves are not God. We have to decide if this is murder or not murder. It's either one or the other. Don't underestimate the redemptive value even of a life of suffering. Even God knows from his perspective so much better than we do what happens and what he can do with a life that is asked to endure and to suffer. And when we say, hey, this person shouldn't suffer, so we know better than them, so they should have an abortion, we're actually circumventing God put in place for their joy and their reward and eternal redemption. We don't know as well as God does how all of these things are supposed to take place. And that is why you and I are not the author of life. He is. So that is why we need to take our hands off of the authority over life and death because we don't know the consequences of what we are doing. And even in situations where it seems horrible for a child to enter into the world in a certain set of circumstances, you and I, we simply do not know the redemptive and miraculous ability of God to bring something good out of something bad. So we take our our hands off of it. I, I was intending to give a short te teaching on something called, uh, well, I gave a name to it, a peer judgment. Uh, Jesus will mention that the, uh, the apostles are going to judge uh, the Jews of that generation. He talks about the Queen of Sheba coming to give judgment. He talks about um, I believe it's uh, in the days of Jonah. Uh, they repented under Jonah, but the people in Jesus, they didn't repent. And sometimes I imagine how this great and terrible day of the Lord is going to transpire, how this final judgment is going to occur. And I think about our generation being the most brutal generation in all of human history, standing on that final day with all of humanity. And I imagine our generation looks at the Nazis and the Germans who tolerated the concentration camps, and we say, how could you have done this? How could you have tolerated 12 million people? You gassed them, you killed them, you tortured them. And you knew this was going on. You didn't stop it, and it occurred. And we pass judgment on you and your generation. And they look at us and say, well, you're right. We did that. But your generation killed over 62 million people. And they weren't men, women, and children. They were only children. And that is what is being laid at the feet of our generation, the most brutal generation in all of human history. Now, I want you to imagine... 1.5 plus billion souls standing up to ask our generation why we tolerated abortion. What are we going to say? I'll tell you right now, I'll be looking at my feet in silence, hoping that I did do something in my lifetime to resist and oppose abortion. And finally, Jesus will say to these mass of murdered people, do you forgive this generation that killed you? And they will say, yes, they're forgiven. All those who call upon the name of the Lord, they're forgiven. And Jesus will look at this generation as well and say, this is why I died. You are forgiven.
Now, if you want to carry forward into an internal perspective of how this is probably all going to work, at least my perspective of it is that after that great and final day of judgment and we're all in heaven and it's literally filled with these children, imagine one climbing up on your lap and saying, tell me, what was it like to live on the earth? Because I never got a chance. Well, it was, it was pretty hard. You know, it was pretty tough. And we had to suffer. Oh, what, what is that? What is suffering? Tell me about that. I don't know what suffering is. Well, it, it's when you overcome pain. And, and that's what we used to glorify God with, with, with overcoming that pain. Oh, I wish I could have had a chance to suffer with Jesus on the earth and give glory to him with my life. But I never got a chance to do that. These are the realities that we need to trust to the living God and take our hands off of life and death in this nation. Only, only God knows the days of our life when they begin and when they should end. And so as we go into a time of worship, if we could uh, put up the slide about taking action, I want to suggest some concrete things that we can be doing. Uh, it is just keep on cruising or I will to the end. There's your peer judgment verses if you want to know where those things come from. These slides will be up on the uh, website. I suppose I will read our final statement as tribe is taking positions this summer. As scripture describes the human person predating conception, a sequence of life beginning with God exists that is not to be disrupted by abortion. Abortion is murder, killing the flesh and eliminating the opportunity for a person to, to join in the sufferings of Christ on the earth. We are not God, the author of life, and therefore we have no authority to end it. We must take every conceivable action in our lifetimes to end abortion and champion life. Here's some stuff we could do. And uh, since the time is 11 o'clock, here's what we're going to do. If you have kids and you would like to grab them, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, I, I will officially say that uh, we're dismissed for that reason. However, what we're going to do is the worship team is going to continue to play. And I want a couple of things to happen simultaneously. Justin's sending out a text uh, corporately to our church to give you links to some, some things that you can do. On our website, uh, on the page for this message and the slides and the other information is there. One of the things you can do is you can sign a petition called the Moral Outcry, which is targeted directly at the Supreme Court. It is a petition targeted directly to them to end abortion. You can sign that petition. I would encourage you to support great pro-life organizations like the ACLJ. These guys are lawyers fighting the kinds of battles we need fought in our day and age. I would encourage you to financially support Assure Women's Center and all that they are doing. Those things you, you can do on your phone even before you leave this building. You can support them financially and you can sign the petition. In the state of Nebraska, there's a law called LB814 which is uh, targeted, I, I wanna encourage you to support it. And what it does is it makes the dismemberment of uh, children being aborted illegal. Dismem dismemberment abortion, it makes it illegal. Uh, I believe City Light put out a great like form letter and has given the emails and the phone numbers for all the state senators in our state that are undecided. Send them an email, send them a letter saying, I support this bill, LB814. All of this is on Tribe's website under this message. All of this information is there. I'd encourage you to do these things on your phone before you even leave this building. Send an email to these senators saying, I support this bill to make this illegal. Sign the petition that's going to the Supreme Court saying, end abortion now. 
during prayer and worship time, I would encourage you to just to cry out in repentance for this nation and pray that abortion be ended. I also want uh, some prayer time for the Maleks. Justin Reeves is going to lead a small team. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind sitting up in those chairs for a couple minutes. We're, these guys are in the trenches, and they are fighting this battle to end this atrocity. And so uh, Justin Reeves is going to be the prayer leader. And like we often do, like we usually do, I just want to encourage you to come up, surround them, pray for them, pray for a sure, pray that they be covered with God's angels, God's protection, and God's favor. And so if you want to slip away, you can do that. But I would encourage you to pray. I would encourage you to get on your phone, sign petitions. I'd encourage you to get on your phone, send emails. I'd encourage you to stay here and pray, pray, pray for this issue. I'd encourage you to stay here and pray for the Maleks. Bless them, cover them, minister to them. And so if you need to slip out, you can do it. There won't be another closing after this. We're just going to pray, worship, and take whatever actions that we can take into this issue. So, Lord, I, I bless you. I thank you. And I cry out for mercy for this nation. Mercy for my generation. Mercy for young mothers who are absolutely desperate to are facing very difficult situations who do need to be taken care of, that they'd be taken care of by the church and that they would make a decision for life and not end their baby's life. So, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to dive into these issues and to talk about these hard things. And we cry out for mercy for this nation. And we say thank you that we can meet today, that we can have church. And we pray that you will, God, I just ask that you will speak into the hearts of this tribe and to everyone watching through the stream and to anyone else. Speak, speak the things that you're saying. Maybe, maybe it's time to be a volunteer for a sure. Maybe it's time to give some money to help, help lawyers fighting this. Sign a petition or contact a senator. God, I just pray that you will give us the grace and the, the power just to step in and do something, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to pray and worship for a time. And I just encourage you to enter into all of these things. Malix, if you'll come up, we want to pray for you. So, so good. 